Bergson, and the holographic theory. Today, the abduction of the GPTs, or C.S. Pierce's notion of abduction, the essential and missing part of the triad, deduction, induction, abduction, and of course, abduction source in Bergson. I've watched several recent videos discussing artificial general intelligence, AGI, and the GPTs, general pre-trained transformers, GPT-3, GPT-4, and GPT-5. For instance, Lex Friedman loves the GPTs. Here he's talking to Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, of, of ChatGPT, and Eliezer Yukowski, who fears very badly that we're going to be destroyed by AIs. Always there are some questions. Is GPT-4 now AGI? Are we already there? How close are we? Is it GPT-5? Is GPT-4 conscious? If not, else when? Most answers. There's sparks of AGI already in GPT-4, like this article is referring to. Sparks of artificial general intelligence in GPT-4 already showing signs. For AGI, it's only going to take 18 months. Or Dr. Alan Thompson there with for 42% already of the way to AGI. GPT-4 conscious, well, we're not quite sure. They, they're not really actually sure how to answer that question. They think perhaps so. Is AGI inevitable? And soon, yes, it's inevitable. Again, AGI. The ability of a machine to perform at the same level as a human, and I'm quoting, not just in thinking, but also in embodiment and acting, I'm quoting an AI expert. Which is to say, given um, all dimensions of human action and embodiment and acting, that AGIs will become chop champions. They will take arbitrary uh, ingredients and, and whip up really fancy desserts. That is, they will replicate, understand human knowledge of taste, flavors, textures, all the subtleties thereof, and do this all by having scraped Wikipedia text. Amazing. To be frank, this is both a strange arrogance and ignorance. AI folks seem to have no need to study perception, cognition, memory, cognitive development, philosophy of mind. They hold themselves beyond this all. True, there are also a few skeptics, for example, Gary Marcus in the AI community. Let's look at something they're ignoring. So we're going to be looking at Charles Sanders Pierce, just a bit. American philosopher, logician, mathematician, and scientist is also, also known as the father of pragmatism. And I discovered this interesting book by Eric Larson, The Myth of Artificial Intelligence 2021, where he takes quite a long look at uh, the notion of abduction. So for Pierce, every observation that shapes the complex of ideas and judgments of intelligence begins with a guess, what he termed an abduction. And here's a quote that Larson likes from, from Pierce. Looking out my window, this lovely spring morning, I see an azalea in full bloom. No, no, I do not see that. Though that is the only way I can describe what I see. That, the azalea in full, full bloom, is a proposition, a sentence, a fact. But what I perceive is not proposition, sentence, fact, but only an image, which I make intelligible, in part by means of a statement of fact. This statement is abstract, but what I see is concrete. So we're seeing this obvious in already uh, oscillation between the concrete and the abstract, or just what exactly is the abstract? Does it have any actual existence without the concrete? I perform an abduction when I do so much as express in a sentence anything I see. The truth is that the whole fabric of our knowledge is one matted felt of pure hypotheses, confirmed and refined by induction. Not the smallest advance can be made in knowledge beyond the state of vacant staring without making an abduction at every step. So for AI, this is not good. 
we're starting with perception. We have to see the azaleas out there. We have to see that azalea. Note the absolute centrality of abduction for Pierce. Note for Pierce, it is an abduction that is responsible for the advance of knowledge. Any characterization otherwise is missing the point. And we're going to see that in postscript one. So where does abduction fit with induction and deduction? So let's start with deduction. AI, the old version of AI, now called good old fashioned AI, go five, started down the deduction path. The schema for deduction is kind of simple. A implies B. Then we see B, therefore A. For example, if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet. It's raining, the sidewalks are wet. This is a classic deductive ruler form called modus ponens. Following this form, proof is guaranteed if you're faithful to the form. But is there any relevance? If it's raining, then pigs will fly. It's raining, therefore pigs will fly. So a perfectly valid modus ponens argument, but the premise is false, so a useless argument. Another one, if it's raining, then planes will fly. It's raining, therefore planes will fly. Also valid with the fact that it's raining has nothing to do with planes being in the air. Relevance is again zero. Obviously, deduction's power depends on knowledge. Another example, eat arsenic, then one dies in 24 hours. Joe ate arsenic. He died in 24 hours. Seems valid, but there's a myriad of other reasons Joe could have died, which we come at and through through our knowledge, our experience of why people die. This led GoFi to massive attempts to create knowledge bases to guide deduction. One project called the Psych Project by Doug Leonard or Encyclopedia. This consisted of manual entry into a database of the infinity of facts that humans seem to know. Like roads are flat, cars drive on roads, cars have wheels, the wheels can turn in different directions, snow falls on roads, snow falls in the snow, and on and on and on. This was a Sisyphean task, rolling that ball up the hill. The database became and becomes massively unwelding, unwieldy with no end in sight. And, and of course, the deductive apparatus just gets enormous. In fact, that author, Eric Larson, worked on this. Another point, this is Barney, full Latin name, Barnabas Lucius Quintilius Maximus, commander of the uh, legions of the farm on the rat frontier. Barney, no, a characterization of the problem is tacit knowledge from Polanyi in 1966, the book, The Tacit Dimension. There's myriads of facts I know about Barney. He has two eyes, has three battle scars, how he walks, how he hunts rats. He's a great rat hunter. But not, none of this is stored as propositions. And there's just an infinity of it. But this is just my experience, therefore, of Bar with Barney. That's, that's what we're talking about. Out of which, just like the azaleas, I can form propositions. Yep, Barney has two eyes. He has three battle scars. Again, we will need a device that stores this experience. So GoFi and deductive efforts dominated into the 1990s. Then came the web and big data. GoFi and knowledge bases abandoned and enter the reign of induction. Induction. Acquiring knowledge from experience, from observations, and generalizing from the observations. Primary mechanism, enumeration. Classic case, swans. Observation after observation of swans. Huge number of swans, they're always white. Therefore, all swans are white. Induction. Another form, statistical sampling. Same difference here. 65% of voters sampled are for person X. Therefore, person X will get 65% of the vote. Modern AI, the GPTs, are based in this statistical framework that is the inductive framework. Of course, we know the intrinsic problem for David Hume. We must believe that instances of which we have no experience resemble those of which we have had experience. But there could be a 
black swan. Hume's critique was related to causation. Enumeration does not equal knowledge of cause. You don't know why the swans are white and, and if you're, you're flummoxed when a black swan comes. What if swans became, are white because of habitat? It's a safe color given where they live. Another habitat, well, maybe black is good. Lots of different reasons why the swans are white versus maybe once in a while a black swan. Hence, you have AI theorists like Judea Pearl working heavily on causal reasoning. Induction does not have the resources to answer this, nor does deduction, save partially at best. So, AI is casting intelligence as detecting statistical regularities, but we've seen the problems. We have a training set, tons of images of cars parked. The net uh, looks at them and learns to classify, being trained to classify this as cars parked. Then there's a test set. What are those? Well, the AI says car, car parked, the, the neural net, the deep learning net, car parked, car parked, car parked. On neural nets, AI's Joshua Bengio, to quote, they tend to learn statistical regularities in the data set rather than higher level abstract concepts. But the abstract concept is via the experience of driving parking cars and VR imagination. I can imagine, for example, how this car got on the divider. I can do the visual transformations or the, the uh, counterfactuals as they're called. It did not get there, obviously, by parking. The AR is a glorified enumerative induction engines. In games where they shine, they're guided by hypotheses within the constrained rules of play. There's, there, in other words, they're living in a very tightly constrained sandbox and the rules always work. The real world has changed, new observations and surprise. This brings us to abduction. When we see to understand, understand particular facts, why the black swan, why the car and the concrete divider, we enter the realm of abduction. Induction is, as we saw from observations, all the swans to regularities, they seem to be always white. Abduction from events to their causes. In abduction, we're looking at events and going to their causes. In Pierce's mind, abduction is associated with surprise. I run across a patch of matted grass. The surprising fact C, the matted grass is observed. But if A were true, C would follow. It is maybe there's deer there, then matted grass would follow. Hence, there's a reason to think that A is true. There were deer walking around. The everyday world is a constant stream of such um, surprises. These are clues to their causes also, the matted grass. Larson evokes hunters. The tracks, the broken twig, the matted grass, the sounds telling the hunter he's being used as clues or cues, we'll say later on, to um, find the deer. I'm no deer hunter, but this is one hunting experience I'll relate quickly with instantaneous complex abduction, so far as I can see. This is back in Vietnam in 1968 in the Marines. And those jungled hills up there, um, that place where the helicopters landing is called the rock pile. And uh, my recon team, six men was up in those hills, six of us. You get dropped in there by helicopter and stay there about five days watching for the NVA. Every evening, at e early in the evening one day, we stopped on a finger running down from those high hills there, um, just below the jungle trees of the hill, low grass, about three feet tall. We ate our sea rations before moving to our night position. We hadn't moved there yet. Stay in a different spot at night. You don't want to be spotted at a certain spot and then get attacked at night. So we moved out, it was around dusk. 
into taller grass. We barely had gone a few yards and we started seeing matted grass spots, several of them, the abduction. Some NVA, North Vietnamese Army, had been right by us as we ate. They had gone up the hill into the jungle trees to fetch a much larger unit there, which was soon coming down for us. Wednesday took a hard right, other side of the finger. Within 30 seconds, we heard a unit crashing down, probably 100 men. Flashlights began searching everywhere. We were eating down below us, down the hill, etc. Um, I won't go into how we got out of there, but I'm here. And I was always struck by the instantaneous complexity of the inference and the quickness of action. It was an abduction. Now there's a conjectural aspect to abduction. This is important, a conjecture to plausible hypotheses. This is why we, it, it, it's the advancing of knowledge. This leads to logical trouble though. Again, A implies B. If, the, if men were laying down, the grass is matted. B, the grass is matted, the observation. Inference, men were laying down. But this is a logical fallacy. It's called affirming the consequence. There's all kinds of reasons why the grass could have been matted. It could have been Sasquatches, Vietnamese Sasquatches. There are some deer sitting there, a python, lots of pythons around there too. Tiger, yep, even a tiger, and, and, and so on. To quote Larson, viewing the logical form of abduction as a variant of bad deduction helps explain why it has been ignored historically in studies of reasoning and why it has resisted mechanical methods. It just looks like affirming the consequence. Pierce's schema show why these forms cannot be reduced to one another. If we lay it all out, here's the deduction that we saw. Men laying down, uh, if men were laying down, the grass is matted. Men were laying down, therefore the grass is matted. A good deduction. Induction, we've observed millions of men laying down. The grass is always matted. Therefore, when men lay down, the grass is matted. Now, abduction. Notice the difference between abduction and deduction. Again, if men were laying down, the grass is matted. The observation, the grass is matted. Conjecture, men were laying down, better run. In other words, abduction by its very nature cannot be an extended form of deduction because its logical form is an egregious deductive fallacy. It begins with a conjecture or a guess by which by definition might be wrong. Could have, could have been a python. There are th so the three are distinct, but intrinsically interdependent for intelligence. Induction is inadequate and deduction is inadequate. Artificial general intelligence requires abduction. If it doesn't have abduction, it isn't going to be AGI. The fact is, look at the characterization of abduction. You see a set of things only supportable by Bergson's device, as we've been discussing. Remember our little scheme of the device. We have a, a brain within a holographic field. The field is indivisibly transforming. The brain is forming a reconstructive wave specific to a source within the field, right where it says it is. That cup is right where it says it is within the field. It's not a simulation not a model of the world within the brain. And it's at a scale of time, a buzzing fly, as opposed to a fly flapping his wings or something like this. And as we'll see, the brain's wave is modulated by the invariant structure of the external event. We'll talk about the invariant structure again. So look at this list, causal reasoning, imagination, counterfactuals, surprise, relevance. Analogical reminding, we've actually seen that even in just the discussion we've had. We'll revisit. Storage of our concrete experience, all of it in reality. And did I mention actual perception, actually seeing the copy being stirred out there in the world on the tabletop. That is our experience. Well, let's briefly look at some of these. For starters, we've seen this. Bergson actually has a model of perception. It requires an entirely different device from a Turing machine, aka a neural net. We can form these propositions. 
I'm seeing the coffee. I'm seeing the stirring spoon that is out of the field of experience. We can uh, make propositions about a partial subset characterization of this experience. I'm seeing the coffee does not begin to carry the whole of the coffee experience. Just as Pierce says, I'm seeing azaleas. But he says, but no, I'm not really feeling seeing azaleas. That's not really describing the beginnings of the perception. Now, because perception is virtual action, I'm because I'm seeing the pos body's possible action on the cup, on the fly, these now being parsed out objects from the field. Yes, it gives me some affordances. I'm seeing how I can act upon the field. The fly, the cup are now meaningful symbols. This is the resolution of the symbol grounding problem. They're meaningful because they're tied, the cup, the fly, intrinsically to action, therefore meaning. Now a reminder, this is all at a brain specified scale of time. We can change that scale of time. We can, we can change the biochemical dynamics underlying that scale of time. Introduce a catalyst. We can slow time, slow time, the time scale down to a, a heron-like fly barely flapping its wings. Again, the action is possible. Action is adjusted, adjusted accordingly. We can reach out, perhaps grab that heron-like fly by the wing. AI, totally independent of dynamics, has nothing to say about this. That is, all it cares about is the computations, the, the statistical analyses in its GPTs. And these can be done by a Turing machine with infinite tape or a modern computer. But it should bother them that they have nothing to say about the scale of time. If I'm living in a scale where the fly is a world of electrons, I'm living in an entirely different world of experience than anything the AI can, uh, well, be tuned to, shall we say. But this does not bother them because they're too uh, ingrained in our frame of uh, thinking about the world. The specification is to a time extent of the past transformation, a past transformation of the field. The light from that coffee cup has gone into the brain long, and you're looking at the coffee cup from, well, long ago, depending on the scale of time that you're looking at. The fly, the cup, the spoon's motion are in the past. The specification is enabled by the field's transformation being indivisible. It's not a series of instants or a series of states, especially computer states. We are then talking of a four-dimensional being. And the experience is not stored in the brain, it trailing, as it were, in the four-dimensionality of our being. But it is accessible, as we've discussed, in its entirety. So we come to another element of abduction, surprise. There's tons of coffee stirrings in our four-dimensional being. Each event has a similar structure, that invariant structure we've talked about many times. It's a structure driving the brain's modulated wave pattern. It consists of tons of invariance laws, velocity flow fields with ratios defined over them, the idiotic ratio, the energy of oscillation and frequency oscillation as we as frequency of oscillation as we move the spoon periodically. So that's driving the modulation pattern. So the current event resonates with this invariance structure. It's like driving a wave through our 4D experience. So the whole experience and a mode thereof resonates in a mode of stirring to that current event. Now introduce an anomaly. Let's say the coffee starts looking like this. It's, as we're stirring, it, it starts to rise over the cup, up and down, up and down. In other words, in a way, we're looking at what we are. This is just a version of the what's called the frame problem. Put differently, how does the robot recognize that the event is not as expected? That is, how is it surprised? Well, when we introduce the anomaly, there's an instant dissonance. And there's a felt surprise. That, that, that cup is no longer, that event is no longer resonating with the stirring. So now more abduction fun begins. 
What is going on, we ask. Well, where do the hypotheses come from? We start with the fundamental retrieval operation, redintegration. What does the new event structure redintegrate? Remember, by redintegration, we're driving the brain with a, a modulation pattern, uh, and that's all those stirrings are resonating to that uh, to that current event. We're redintegrating the past events. So we have a new event structure now. It's a rising mass. It's mysteriously constrained within a column. It's falling again up and down rhythmically. What does that now remind us of? What does it redintegrate? Again, like driving a wave through. Well, there's pistons and there's dough rising, yeast rising. Uh, maybe there's a, uh, a UFO uh, will pull things up, maybe put them back down again. So that would be a hypothesis. Is there some sort of yeast in that cup? Interesting, strange. Or another hypothesis, has the cup got a piston-like bottom? But how does the liquid stay in a column? That's an interesting question. Or some sort of force drawing it up, like from a UFO. So we're redintegrating from 4D experience via cues, or again, that word clues, is, is this is the start of the, the hypotheses, the conjectures. This is where these conjectures and hypotheses come from, which are the heart of abduction. It is also analogical reminding. These are analogies to that event. Analogical reminding. For Hofstadter and Sander in their book, Services and Essences, which we've discussed already, all thought is found in an analogy, all thought. An example, the main author, Hofstetter, is visiting the North Rim of the Grand Canyon uh, with his wife and uh, son, Danny, the E event on the, on the right. In the midst of this scene of great majesty and splendor, Danny bends down, intent on watching some insects in the sand. So that's the first event. Many years later, again, Hofstetter is visiting the great temple of Karnak on, on the left there, E prime. His friend, Dick, suddenly seems more interest, focused on bending down and peering at a small bottle cap, an object for which he has an obsession for collection, on the ground. The former scene at the Grand Canyon comes rushing back to Hofstetter in memory. So we've got E prime redintegrating E. We have, in other words, an analogical reminding, a redintegration. But the mechanism of analogical reminded totally eluded Hofstetter and Sander. They saw it required storage of the totality of all our experience. But how? They considered and rejected the idea that events are stored as unindexed videos on DVDs, as it were, in the brain. Something to that effect. And the massive storage of experience in the brain, totally unindexed. We've got Karnak on one. CD, the Grand Canyon, and another. How in heck do you travel, search through that entire pile of memory and find the uh, similarity between that event on Karnak and that event in the Grand Canyon? To Hofstetter and Sanders, they decided, well, well, they say, each concept of our mind, in our mind, owes its existence to a long succession of analogies. Now, the concept here, they decided, was quote, attention on the trivial in the context of a grand geological architecture scene, architectural scene of great majesty and splendor. So each concept in our mind owes its existence to a long succession of analogies made con unconsciously over many years. Again, that could be the coffee stirring concept. That could be wielding a spoon concept. It could be voting. It's, everything that we consider a concept. Initially giving birth to the concept to continue to enrich it over the course of our lifetime. Now, there's a different view. Casanto and Lupian in 2015. All concepts are ad hoc. That is, we are they all are dynamically formed via retrieval cues that would be reintegration in the moment. No concepts are ever stored, no concepts per se. 
all are being recre recreated in the moment via context-dependent retrieval of experience. No concept is ever quite the same from one time to the next. This is the point for here. Pierce's abduction fully embraces the operation, problem, and centrality of analogy and rests on redintegration. Now, imagination and counterfactuals. Imagination is central to coming up with hypotheses. A hidden piston, a tractor beam. Again, for this, you must have solved perception in the first place, the origin of the image of the cup with the surface being stirred, the spoon stirring. That is the origin of images, then of reinstantiating images from experience. Then you require a being embedded in the indivisible transformation of the universal field. You need the indivisibility, indivisible continuity of these visualized transformations. We've made this point before. That is, when you're doing the transformations that Penrose envisaged up there as visual proof of a competition does not, does not stop. Folding a hexagonal number in, in a th three-sided structure and stacking that structure over the previous cube over and over and over, each time making a cubical number, a computation that will never stop. But you need the indivisible continuity of that visualized transformation, else you cannot perceive the, lo the glo globality of the transform and the invariance preserved over it. If it's just a series of states, instantaneous states, one comes and drops it into non-existence and the other one comes, drops into non-existence and the other state comes, you're never gonna perceive the, the global transformation over which invariance is formed or preserved. So yes, you're back to Penrose's non-computational thought here as well. Causal reasoning that's been clearly involved in what we've been describing here. I'm not saying there's a detailed understanding of how all this works within a general framework of Bergson's device, but we require these basic elements. The brain is a modulated reconstructive wave passing through a holographic field specific to a source. By this process, an image of the cup, of the coffee cup, an image within the field. The transformation of this field must be indivisible continuous, and the self as a 4D being, trailing, as it were, all this experience that can be drawn upon for abduction. This is the core reason why abduction will not yield to the neural nets. A little bit on large language models and language. Now, so Larson spends time discussing the failure of large language models, the GPTs, on language, due to lack of common sense knowledge and abduction at the heart of using this knowledge. A nice example that he had at the time was, can a crocodile run in a steeplechase? Can a crocodile? Uh, and at that time when he was writing, which wasn't that long ago, 2021, wasn't that long ago, th this question could not be answered. It was a problem. It's due to the unlikely association that database between crocodiles and steeplechases, you're not, you're not likely to find that. Now they seem to have solved this by what method one would have to go deeply into it because ChatGPT I discovered answers this just fine. Another case was the animal didn't cross the road across the street because it was too tired. You ask what was too tired? Again, these uh, large language models studied for a while. I tried this. And GPT, GPT, chat GPT answered this just fine. It gives you a discourse on uh, why it was, it, was, it would, would have been the road that was too tired, just like it gives you a discourse on why crocodiles don't have the body type to run in steeplechases. I, it's interesting. When you look at part of what this is based on, here's a, a discussion of the illustrated transformer by J. Olimer, one can look this up. My little first picture there is, you know, it consists of tons of weight matrices. And ultimately, uh, in the transformer part, 
the, because they're looking forwards and backwards in this language string, notice the animal didn't cross the road because it was too tired. They're trying to weight the it toward the animal, the animal being what the it refers to, not the road. Of course, notice what they're trying to do. They're trying to avoid desperately uh, using, or relying on the common sense that people have that roads aren't things that get tired. Though, unfortunately, you see where this just all goes. I, I can easily Im imagine a, a passage pro saying, well, the road is very tired. It had been around for, you know, 100 years and, and needed repair. It was a tired road. So you're going to get uh, difficulties coming up also because the human mind just isn't that constrained. So it's doing so at least partially with this transformer algo adjusting weights to put attention on the it. I thought, well, let's try another um, another thing where we, 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 just, we adjust what the it is referring to. Here we have the cat didn't eat the rat because it was festering. The it now referring to the rat, not to the cat. Well, ChatGPT answered this one too, telling me it was probably because the rat wasn't in a good uh, healthy state and uh, therefore the cat didn't want to eat it. Which is... So they've done things, this is interesting. One would have to go deeply into what they've done because again, they're just using a massive pile of statistics, looking at text to, to try to put stitch all this together as a form of fake knowledge of the world. There's other schemas one could try. There's the Winograd schemas. For example, Sam tried to paint a picture of shepherds with sheep, but they ended up looking more like golfers who look like golfers, the shepherds of the sheep. These schemas, you're, you're demanding that to be actual common sense knowledge. So one could keep probing. I got a little bit tired of it right away. This, but the system is just faking knowledge. Eventually, it's going to get exposed. Larson discusses something like this. Margaret saw a magpie on a tree. She loathed it. So here it is taken as the magpie. But you can see Mar Mar Margaret saw a songbird land on her favorite tree. She loved it even more. That now switches it to the tree. And then if you nix even the even more phrase, that requires further background about Margaret, the songbird, and the tree. In other words, we're getting more and more to the actual need of knowledge about uh, Margaret and her world. Larson says this is undercoded. That is, it requires an appreciation of the frame of the discussion. Well, that's interesting because the frame is absolutely the problem of common sense knowledge or, or our, our experience of the world. So back to the frame. Let's frame the problem first. I noted how does the robot recognize something in the event is unexpected? What if five turkeys walk by while I'm stirring the coffee, as, as opposed to that up and down column rising? Well, in my mini farm frame, that's perfectly expected. Turkeys walk by all the time. And we live in multiple frames in reality. Don't forget the garbage truck coming by. That, while I'm stirring coffee, that, that's expected also. But you're, you're starting to require all the context that I live in in the farm to understand whether this is an expected part of the event or not. It's from those frames that we assess the meaning of things. So we talked about this before. Here, Hofstadter and Sanders take a paragraph an obituary for Francois Sagan. It was written in Le Mans in September 2004. There's the French. I'm not going to read it, but it's there for reference. And we looked at the Google 2009 translation. So sometimes the success was not at the rendezvous. We think very hard. The right number does not necessarily come out. Sagan took dramatic author failures like casino setbacks with respect for the whims of the bank and the sky. You have to lose a little to better savor the next day's win. What is not seen it recover in a few quarters of an hour, the losses of a whole night can, un can understand how joyful it is to taunt the spell. Well, the last sentence is, um, you know, not uh, sensical, is nonsensical. 
And back in 2009, the machine didn't seem to understand that it was nonsensical. 2019, Google. Again, success was not at the rendezvous. When we think very hard about it, but the right number does not necessarily come out. Jumping down to the last sentence, that she did not see her recover in a few quarters of an hour, the losses of a whole night can understand how joyful it is to taunt fate. So still struggling with that last sentence. Here's the human translation. Sometimes things just didn't work out right, no matter how hard she wished for it. The dice simply wouldn't come up her way. But Sagan always took her failures as a playwright, much as she took her gambling losses, acknowledging the arbitrary whims of the house and of divine fate. After all, everyone has to lose now and then so that the next day's victory will taste all the sweeter. And if you never saw her win back a whole night's losses in well under an hour, you just can't have any idea of the glee she took in laughing at the fate of face of destiny. Chat GPT a few days ago. Sometimes success doesn't come as expected. Despite thinking very hard about it, the right number doesn't necessarily come up. Sagan took the setbacks of a writer like the losses at the casino, da, 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 da. come to the last sentence. Anyone who hasn't seen her recover losses from a whole night in just a few quarters of an hour can understand how joyful it is to taunt fate. Again, these two sentences, still the same, despite thinking very hard about it, as opposed to no matter how hard she wished for it, the dice simply wouldn't come up. We still have the despite thinking very hard. This sentence, now it makes sense. This sentence, still nonsensical, just bad. And what's sad is the AI doesn't seem to grasp that it's nonsensical. I don't know how it's ever going to. So in this comparison, we have in the French, in the statement there, using uh, a to seal. And Google says, for the whims of the bank and the sky. The human says, for the whims of the house and of divine fate. ChatGPT has got for the whims of the bank and the heavens. A little better. There's something operating here, and it's back to the frame. Uh, Falcon and Turner, uh, as Hoster and Sander knows, discuss this in great detail, this whole notion of frames. Here the frame is of gambling, casinos, and the being Sagan who love gambling. In reality, the frame is extremely dynamic. Dynamics. Seal can be a sky, heaven, business, bl blueness, sorry, sorry, heaven, blueness, air, midair, a vault, canopy, ceiling, clouds, the atmosphere, space. The frame will determine the selection. But Google then did not understand the frame. In this frame, seal must be something like heaven, fate, luck, providence. And the bank is the house, the internal bank of the casino. So ChatGPT has got the heavens a little better. It's still got the bank there. It still doesn't quite seem to realize we're in a casino situation. No, it does say that, but not clear why it's using the bank. Again, this sentence. Um, we think very hard. The right number doesn't come, not necessarily come out. Google 2019, basically the same thing as chat GPT. And again, for human, no matter how hard she wished for it. Again, a subtle aspect of our experience, the frame in this dynamic frame, our intense wishing for a great outcome when the dice roll or the roulette wheel spins. It's hardly ever, we think very hard. This just doesn't resonate as relating to the proper frame. But this dynamic frame is beyond the machine. That is, the machine has nothing of this dynamic experience, this, this 4D memory. They're trying to fake it. So conclusion. The GPTs are trying to achieve human thought via massive brute force. Massive brute force, enumerative induction, ignoring achieving actual experience and the abductive in inference therefrom. And the AI, AI folk think this complex math, matrix math, 
and taking of derivatives is what the brain is actually but badly doing. Look at um, Connor Leahy there, that quote, I think that the human beings are approximating what GPT-3 is doing and not vice versa. You have to think about that one for a second. He's actually saying that GPT-3 is doing the same thing that brains are doing, only much better. Yes. Oh, well, why would a theory of how we, with our primitive mathematically deficient, bumbling brain, see the coffee cup out there on the kitchen table with spoon stirring, why would that be of any importance? So the first postscript. I ran across this 2022 article. The authors fundamentally key off arguments like some of my uh, meditation on a mousetrap arguments in that article, the impossibility of predefining functions of an object, say of a pencil in a database and the implications. And you can see there, they, they say, um, we observe that all these characters, characteristics are connected to the ability of identifying and exploiting new affordances, opportunities for impediments on the path of an agent to achieve its goals. A general example of an affordance is the use of an object, remember a pencil, in the hands of an agent. We show that it is impossible to predefine a list of such uses. Same argument says the meditation. I would say if they read my Gibson and Time article on ecological psychology, uh, they would see what affordances actually entail, and that would, well, that would be an interesting. Uh, reaction. But in general, good arguments, uh, especially, you know, when they, they get to the point of, well, can robots, because one of the things that AI is going to is we're going to match up robot action with these um, massive statistical large language models, and then we're really going to have something powerful. And they analyze that as well. Can Is that going to save them? And the argument is no. So there's good arguments but no model of perception in their thought or a sense of what this problem actually is. But they say this, for a long time, we have believed that coming to know the world is a matter of induction, deduction, and abduction. Here we show this is not enough. The significance of the fact that AI has never implemented abduction seems to have escaped them. Now, there, there, it could be they're being misled by this. There was an, an abductive logic programming, ALP effort. Larson notes this. Abduction was treated as a truth-preserving deductive inference. It derives from a knowledge base to the truth of A implies B. Again, if men were laying here, the grass is matted, where A is an explanation of B, the observation. This eliminated the conjectural basis of abduction. Remember, you cannot eliminate the conjectural basis of abduction. But having done that, no inferential power is gained. Hence, ALP was abandoned. Again, what you have to imagine is that they're trying to, they are trying to put in a database all of these conditionals. If the grass, if the men were laying here, the grass is mattered. If, if it's raining, the planes are flying. They're, they're trying to load a database with all of these uh, A imply B, and then you know assert B. So they're trying to fix, fix the world, fi fix it, uh, you know this dynamic flow, shall we say, of experience in this database. And given our discussion here on Pierce's vision versus their description of induction, take a look at that. See, abduction is a differential diagnosis from a pre-stated set of conditions. Remember that database I just talked about, A imply B. Pre-stated set of conditions and possibilities that articulate to carry out what we see the system as doing or being, but there is no unique decomposition. A number of decompositions is, in, in, is indefinite. Therefore, when implemented in a computer program, that this kind of reasoning cannot reveal novel features of the world. So again, as I said, they're, they're simply going off that second bullet. They're, they're reiterating that second bullet. I have Zen in the art there in the motorcycle because 
um, notice that the very beginning of the sentence is suppose the battery is dead. Well, again, they're looking at cars. How would you decompose cars, the whole structure of a car, you know, the, all, all the parts of a car how, into a, a this set of conditionals? Exactly the point that Piercing made in Zen and the Art. All the different ways you could describe a motorcycle, oftentimes none of which necessarily uh, applied to your particular problem. But it is relying on a set of pre-stated conditions that is precisely what abduction does not do. And that's precisely why it cannot be implemented by AI. So in other words, there's a severe underestimate out there underestimate out there of what abduction really involves. Again, second full script, AGI in 18 months. Well, this is how David Shapiro is going to do it. He's going to roll out episodic memory. Yep, create episodic. That is all of our experience. Here's a little diagram uh, looking at the logs of, of uh, chat, GP, chat discussions. Got the chat participant message there, time stamp. So he's storing chat sessions, the chat participant, the message, the timestamp, and he's organizing the chat sessions. Got a semantic consolidation layer there, clustering algorithms, etc. So he's going to store all experience, but what is the experience he's storing, quote unquote, is nothing but chat discussions. It's certainly not this. The four-dimensional structure of experience and with zero theory of this the origin of the dy dynamic image of the external, external world the experience that has to be stored and that's we don't need that either so ai's ignorance of the subject of memory is boggling ignorance fuels the optimistic euphoria so next we'll see so then, signing off.